Well, as Craig said, this is the uh, sixth in our series of cultural lectures. And as he also outlined, uh, you know, the museum has two pieces. It has a museum piece, which we're very proud of, and it also has this lecture series piece, which is a cultural and an enlightening piece of what we do in the name of the Catawba Island Historical Society. So uh, this, I think, is going to be my personal favorite of the lecture series that we've had. Not to demean what John Gibson did. John uh, did a wonderful uh, presentation on the uh, uh, bootlegging days, prohibition. And so it's going to be a toss up between John and Randy, I think. And John has one of them because he came in costume and Randy obviously did not come in costume. <laughs> but anyway, my uh, comments here, because I know you didn't come, and I don't think you came to hear me, but you know, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Randall uh, Buckman. Uh, Dr. Buckman is a distinguished emeritus professor of history at the Defiance College. He is here with his lovely wife and a number of kids and relatives. I guess they occupy pretty much the first row here, so welcome and cheer on your uh, relative here. Uh, Dr. Buckman will acquaint us with tonight's, in tonight's uh, lecture that relates to the Indian tribes and their cultural collision with the British, the French, and the American immigrants, as I like to call them. Dr. Buckman has written extensively about the Native Americans, and I, for one, am looking forward to learning more about our early American inhabitants. Uh, the lecture series lasts about 45 minutes, and there will be a Q&A period following that. So, with that being said, unless you came here to hear Craig and I prattle, uh, I will uh, have a show of hands who came to hear me. <laughs> Darlene, put your hand up. <laughs> so I will turn the uh, microphone over to Dr. Rice. Or Dr. Buckman, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. The first thing they told me is put the microphone right underneath your lip. And I got a fat lip and I don't know if it's going to work too well or not. But the thing that's got me worried about is you've been using the word history. And the students at Defiance College in the high schools I taught in used the word hysteria. Uh, Somewhere in between hysteria and history, I fit. And what I'm going to do tonight is to talk to you about the people who picked my imagination when I was about six years old. I was born and raised on the Portage River outside of Oak Harbor. You know it as the Oak Harbor Golf Course. That was my home. And when I was a young child, I was working in the fields with my dad, and I picked up this stone that was shaped in an unusual way. And I went to my dad, who had answers for everything, and said, Dad, what is this? And he says, I don't know, but it belonged to the people who lived here before me. My dad was from New York City. He didn't know a damn thing about Ohio or Indians or anything like that. So that got me started. And as you heard, my career then took me on. I decided then to go to the first grade. <laughs> I made it through, well, was only 13 years to do 12. I went on to college and then started going on for advanced degrees. And, uh, you know, that gets to be boring. Sometime I decided I ought to make a living. So I went to work with the Ohio Historical Society as a research history, research historian. From there I went into public school and then finally at the college level. And now I'm at what you call retirement phase one. I'm still adjusting. My mind is still a little active, but the rest of my body is in not too good a shape. But I'd like to share with you then a little bit to help you understand the Native Americans that lived here 
at the time that the white man first penetrated Catawba Island. Now realize the people of Ohio, in the categorical way that we put it, the Native Americans were woodland Indians. What means, if you're a woodland Indian, means about four major things. One, you live in a wooded area. That's unique, isn't it? They call them woodland Indians. They live around trees. The second thing, they are hunters. And their predominant source of food is hunting. The second thing is, they are gatherers and they are reaping the benefit of the natural fauna and flora of the area, nuts and berries and so forth. The third thing is, they're our first gardeners, and they are no more than gardeners. They're not farmers, they're no more than gardeners. But by the time they leave Ohio in 1840, they are truly farmers because if you recall, when Anthony Wayne marched from Defiance, Ohio, to build Fort uh, Meigs in Toledo, he said, I've gone by a cornfield six miles long. I don't go by too many cornfields that itself is six miles long. I go by six miles of corn but not one field occupied by one group of people. So they are woodland Indians rather than desert Indians or seacoast Indians or maritime Indians. And that tells you right away they are hunters, gatherers, and collectors. And that will progress as they go. The second thing about the uniqueness of Catawba Island is two linguistic groups settled in Catawba, in this general area, two different languages. Now, what we forget, people, the day Columbus stepped on the island down in the Caribbean, there were probably 300 languages sp spoken in the Western Hemisphere. Our two language groups are Iroquois, Algonquin. Now, that's like saying, you are a Romance language, you're a Slavic language, you're an Arabic language. There's many little differences within that group, but it's fundamentally the same language family. Now what you call, and I call Algonquin, have tribal names. They are the Delaware, the Miami, the Shawnee, they are typical Algonquin-speaking people. The other group, the Iroquois, are the Wyandots and the Senecas, the, the Cayugas, and so forth. So they didn't speak the same language, but they were similar to each other that they could communicate. And they could communicate mainly because their vocabularies were very limited and they were masters of the use of physical expression, emotionalism and so forth, which I'll try and illustrate for you in a little bit. The other thing is, always remember this, Iroquois-speaking people are what we call patrilineal. Father, sons take the name of the father. The father is of the Bear Clan, the son will be a bear clan. The male is the head of the family. Leadership in that kind of a community will always be in the males, although the women will still sit behind guys and tell them what to do, like they always do. But anyway, then it will be definitely a male-dominated culture. If you're an Algonquin, you take your mother's maiden name. Your mo only chiefs that are her family can be the next chief. No chief of a Algonquin-speaking person could put his arm around his son and say, when you become chief, because the son could never become chief. It had to be through the female side. When you were married, 
you went and lived with the female clan rather than the male clan. So the being multi, or we call patrilineal and uh, the female side was very important and it created a little bit of difference between these two groups that lived here. Now what group dominated Catawba? What tribes really dominated Catawba? Ottawa, probably number one. Ottawa, probably the second group that was heavily populated in this era with the Senecas and the Wyandots. Two Iroquois, one Algonquin. At the same time, we're going to get spin-off of the Miami. We're going to get spin-off of other Algonquin-speaking people that come into this area. Now, another thing that a lot of people look at these two groups and they say, what's the difference? Is their spiritual belief. Now, the one thing you got to understand, whether you're Algonquin or Iroquois, spirit, everything that ever existed has a spirit. The necklace this young lady is wearing right here has a spirit. That necklace if you want to deal with it, it has to be dealt with through its spirit. The life and everything that exists has a spirit. So spiritualism was very much a part of their way of life. Thus we see the great configurations of decorations, the great exotic ways in which they express themselves in the dance. It's all based on their communication to the spirit. When we get ready for the hunt, men, we got to have a dance. And people are going around doing crazy things, dancing in certain ways in the major dance. Most of the time, they're emulating the characteristic of the animal we're going out to hunt because they're trying to appease his spirit and to prove to you, I'm the best catcher of the deer that exists. So the spirit was so important. The other thing that's different between our two groups is Algonquin speaking people, creation comes from below and comes up. Among our Iroquois speaking people, creation comes down. Both of them, had myths that tell you the story of creation. In most cases with the Algonquin, the critter, which is ever their favorite critter, whether it be the mole or whether it be uh, what other animal it be, it comes out of the earth and finds the shade of the great tree. With the Iroquois speaking people, the birth, the creation, is dropped from the heavens by the great bird that is carrying this infant of whatever year has. Now, therefore, they will start to say, we are people of the land, we are people of the air, and the other way that people come up out of the earth is, we are people of the water. So every tribe, every village is divided into three clans, or three freites, we call them. One is the people of the land, the people of the water, the people of the air. So if you're a bear, you're automatically in the land clan. If you're a turtle, you're automatically in the water clan. If you're an eagle, you're automatically in the airplane. They will be a collective group in that village. They will have their own council, their own meetings, their own leader, and their own religious leader. Now, every one of these freites or divisions will have at least three key people. One is the leader, the word chief. And that's why sometimes somebody says, hell, they had more chiefs than they had braves. It's because they had 
a chief for every one of these freites. Besides that, they have a shaman, a religious leader. And then one of the most important people that I finally, when I became a little more mature, not quite as mature as I am now, but anyway, as I became more mature, I started the role of the storyteller, the guy who perpetuated the history and the culture of those people. Those were three important positions in every one of these air, water, or land people. Now within each of these phrases, they had clans, and the clans had a structure. The clans had a structure. So what we see in the clans then is somewhere in their heritage, someone assumed the name of something that he or she admired, depending whether they were Algonquin or Iroquois. And they took that as their clan. Now, whether it was a bear or a deer or the wind or a bird, didn't make any difference. They started to assume that name, and because that name was perpetuated by being handed down, they started to become a clan. Could you marry outside of your clan? Yes, but it depends on which one in the premaritable ceremony thing are you going to be an Algonquin or an Iroquois, or are you going to be a bear, or are you going to be a wolf? All that was determined in the process of courtship. And the neat thing about it, gals, if you weren't satisfied with the cotton picker that you lined up with, <laughs> you just merely took his belongings and put it outside <laughs> of your... Now remember, our people don't live in teepees. They live in wigwams. A wigwam is a soup bowl turned upside down. Only it's about 30 foot or 40 foot across. And there are more than one family living in that wigwam, but they're all of the same clan. They're all of the same language. Now people said, Randy, how could an Iroquois communicate with an Iroquois or an Algonquin. Fundamentally, folks, one of the great things about the Native American language is it's simplistic. So bear with me. I got one, and I'll tell you where I'm coming from. I'm now coming from the Wyandotte language, which I know better than any of them. It's the one I spent most of my time dealing with the Wyandots of Oklahoma, interviewing, talking to them about their linguistic heritage. Now remember, we're talking to people who don't know their own language very well. It's like talking to a third generation German in the United States and say, tell me what this means in German. The guy looks at you, oh, you say, what do you mean? I don't know what that means because it's been lost. But some of the things we've been able to recreate in the Wyandots are one. The other one that we should be very proud of in Ohio is the Miami, which is an Algonquin speaking people. And the greatest place to recover the Miami language is to go to Oxford, Ohio. Daryl Baldwin from Toledo, Ohio, who is a Miami, is the head of that program. And it's really to bring back to the Miami people their culture, their way of life, their traditions, their language, and so forth. Okay, let's get back to Wyandotte. Wow, that's a four-legged animal. I went hunting the other day. You want to know what kind of an animal I killed? One of the things I'll always say is, wah! Unless it wasn't a four-legged animal, but I don't know too many of those. But anyway, wah! 
Well, she's nosy as all get out, so she wants me to tell her what foreign language. I'm going to say, what tea? Tea is branches and trees. Well, you all know now I hunted a what? What has branches and trees? Now the inflection of my voice will tell her. One thing I could say to you is what tea? Or I could say what tea? Or I could say what tea? If I said a small tree, it's a deer. Then I'm going to go to an elk, then I'm going to go to a moose, and then I'm going to quit. <laughs> that doesn't satisfy her. She's a real nosy gal. And she says, well, was it boy or girl? And all I got to do is, what tea? With gestures, inflection of the voice, I just took the tree off of it. It's a female. See why their language is limited, but with facial expression and body expression, they were able to communicate clearly, and people really understood what each other was saying. Those are the people that lived on Catawba Island, Algonquin and Iroquois. Basically, both of them have a very limited vocabulary. Maybe the vocabulary of a six-year-old, maybe a seven-year-old. Now, you all remember back when you were six what your vocabulary was. You know what words you didn't use also in front of mom and dad. But anyway, you had a limited vocabulary, but you were able to communicate your wishes and your desire with your parents. So language then, very important, but very understandable to each other. And with a limited vocabulary and a gesture, they were able to communicate between tribal languages much easier than we can today. They didn't have dictionaries that thick. Their dictionary might be about that thick if you let them go. So what we see happening is these people who spoke a different language had a different basic faith had a strong belief in spiritualism, were able to communicate with each other much easier than the French were with the English or the Spanish with the Dutch. Now, maybe they could communicate as well as a Spaniard can with an Italian or a Russian with a Pole because of the similarities of their language, but much simpler. So we can see Algonquins and Iroquois-speaking people living in cahoots with one another, communicating with one another, and going on hunting trips with one another, just like we do today if we are really truly serious hunters. And remember, they're woodland Indians, they're hunters. And that's still the prime thing that the men do. You see, that's the thing that the men were created. Men were created to do three things, guys. Now, I don't know why we've messed up on a couple of them, but first of all, it was to be a hunter. Secondly, well, my gosh, was it to be a decision maker? No. Not a decision maker if you're an Algonquin speaking person, but if you're an Iroquois, yes. Well, what's the third thing then that you were supposed to perpetuate the race? I'm sorry, that's the second thing. The third thing was to be a warrior. To be a warrior. And very much in your life, very early in your life, you were met with the challenge of proving to me you're a hunter or proving to me you're a warrior. And one of the ways that you can prove that you're a warrior is to bring back and demonstrate to everybody a piece of your enemy. Now, sometimes it was hair, 
Sometimes it was an ear. It might have been part of the nose. I don't know what part of the body the guy decided to take. But to bring back and demonstrate your ability as a warrior, or just to come back from conflict alive many times, or to come back with wounds, that proved to everybody you were a warrior. And very early, you were taken out as a youth and challenged by your family to be a hunter. And as that training, that early nurturing of father to son, that created the likes of people like Tecumseh, Little Turtle, and the great warriors that you study when you talk about the Woodland Indians, the Indians of Ohio, Pontiac, all of those men were trained from youth all the way up because the educational measure of the young man was in the hands of the father. The education of the young man as far as his lineage, what his beliefs were, what spirit, spirits were his, was done by the female. And that's only logical that the female should play that role among the people who lived on Catawba Island. Because from where did birth come? Then who would become the planters in the garden? The women. Why? They gave birth. There's where birth originates is from the female side. So they will become the planters. Will they prepare the cornfield to be planted? No, that may be a man's task. But the planting of the seed, and then the nurturing of that seed in its early stage will be in the hands of the female because that's the culture they grow up in. So it was just natural. And you wonder, why do we always see things of pictures of the women out in the field planting the corn? It's because that is the source of life. The source of birth is, belongs to the female. Therefore, she could carry out. The hunting will be done by the male. The warrior will be done by the male. The perpetuating of the clan, the perpetuating of fellow, will be done by the male. There was these divisions that were pretty well set aside for various segments. One of the other things that fascinates me about Na Native American, which you and I, we learn to understand it in a slang word. How many times did you have a buddy that said, let's trade this, or, hey, this is yours. I, I've had it for a long time. It's now yours. And then maybe a half a year later or two days later, he wants it back. What did we call him? Indian. Indian giver. Why? In both of the cultures that lived on the Catawba Island, unless you created it, you could not give it away. Think about that a minute. I can give you what's in my pocket, but if I didn't create it, I'm only giving you the right to do what? To use it like I have the right to use it. Have I given up my ownership of it? No. It's still mine. You now have the right to use it with me. Now think of that a minute. Treaty. When we asked the Indians to do what? Give up this land, did they create it? No. What they could do is give you the right to use it. And then you know what you suckers did? You come along and put a fence around it. You destroyed their whole way of life as hunters and gatherers when you put the fence around it. You won't let me use it anymore. And yet, I made an agreement with you that you have the right equally to me to use this land. 
So we draw treaty lines in the, our country and our leadership draws all these treaty lines and says, that's yours, this is mine. That's mine, this is yours. Could the Indian accept that? Well, he didn't accept it, why? He didn't understand it. So what do we say? Well, let's go out and teach them how to obey a treaty. Teach them how to obey a treaty, they were obeying it when they walked across your land or they still wanted to hunt on your land. What does that create? Misunderstanding and conflict, folks. Conflict comes because you don't take the time to understand the other side. That's a lesson we should have learned a long time ago as a nation. Right now, I wish Congress would uh, learn that lesson. I wish they'd sit down and talk to a couple of Indians and understand each side of the line and say, no, we can resolve this. But that was a way of life of the people that lived right where we live today. So it's such a fascinating thing when you think of the simplicity of their way of life. And yet, we wanted to convert them to our way of life. And what did we always want to say to the Indians? We've got to civilize them. Well, what did civilizing mean? Destroy the inherent things that they grew up, that they learned from the dearest thing in their lives, their family. Do we need to restore the family back in the culture you and I live in today? Wouldn't be a bad idea to work on it a little bit if you haven't, but I kind of think people that are concerned about history have a little of understanding of the value of the culture of these Native Americans who occupied the land that you're currently occupying. So we got to understand then that the Native American lived here but he had a different attitude towards some basic things than you and I do. But if we don't try to understand that and tolerate that, we'll never be able to build that bridge between their culture and ours. The only thing we gotta remember is that the Native Americans, and like all good college professors, I gotta go back to my notes to see what I forgot to tell you about. Okay, I think the other thing we had a heck of a time doing and was done very much by somebody whose presence in this area, on this island, was very dominant. Tecumseh traveled the northern part of Ohio, Indiana, southern Michigan, and all over the eastern United States. What bothered Tecumseh about his own people? What bothered him more than anybody else was the political structure of Indians. Now, the Indians, as you and I know it, were organized by tribe. Each tribe had a multiplicity of villages. Each village had a multiplicity of families. Okay, tell me something. If the tribe as a whole says go to war, did that mean everybody in the tribe went to war? Did every village have to go to war? No, no. That's where we make one big mistake. So all at once, a raid is made on a white settlement by a group of Shawnees. We know it's Shawnees because of the emblem they left behind. Well, we're going to go find the next Shawnee village and we're going to do. We're going to desecrate it if we can. These Shawnee never probably had anything to do with what happened to you and I. It was a Shawnee from over here because they were at least in Ohio in the time you and I are talking about, about 15 Shawnee villages. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't have as many chiefs that we have to remember. Because you got to remember Blue Jacket. You got to remember Tecumseh. You got to remember to me the Chayan of all Indians, Captain Johnny. Captain Johnny. I always got to bring him for one reason. I've read four eyewitnesses of Captain Johnny. Two of them called him a giant. One of them called him a monster. And the other one said he was seven foot tall. Captain Johnny of the Shawnee. His village was in Defiance, Ohio, on the east side of the Auglaize River. And his family still is existence. In fact, his grandson is John Captain, who is chief of the proper or the loyal Shawnee in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. His grandson, interest, or his great-grandson, interestingly, lives in a town called Hicksville, Ohio, which is a neighbor of Defiance. So I've had access to the heritage of that family. And this guy was a fabulous human being. But can you imagine a guy in the 1700s and the 1800s? Hundred seven foot tall. Oh man, you know LeBron James would really—he'd just drool over a guy like that, you know. So the idea of tribes doing one thing, but villages of that same tribe not participating. This is what bothered Tecumseh. And this is why he became such a traveler in the Midwest and he went to the Deep South and he went among the Cherokee and the Choctaw and the Indians that he knew in the South trying to say, look, when we make a treaty, it's for all the Indians, it's for all the Shawnee, it's for all, of, we got to act in unison. And then he comes back home and he reads or he's told about what William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison made five treaties with five different Shawnee villages giving up their right and their land in Indiana. And that drove Tecumseh crazy. He wanted unity. He realized the weakness of the structure of the Indian people collectively was we didn't act in unison. And we kind of know that in our country, and we know it in the world that you and I live in today. So we, we see from the heritage that you and I grew up here in Ottawa County, and the name of our county, and the name of most of the places in Ohio, we can chase back to our Native American heritage. But do we really recognize the difference in their culture and ours where the mis misunderstanding took place? And can we understand and have the compassion to reach out to that misunderstanding and try and correct it? That's the key that the Native Americans today seek from us. I think the willingness is on their side. I taught in a Native American college for a year. Merrill and I spent a semester in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Yeah, Muskogee teaching at a college called Big Cone, which is founded by the North American Baptist Church, supported by the Daughters of the American Revolution. It's an Indian college. And the first thing that happened to me, the first day I was there, the number one question of most Indians about guys like you and I that have a different color skin, do you have any blood? I don't have any blood. And I told them that. I lost 30% of the class because I didn't have blood. Now, after I got done talking to them, for a couple of days, pretty soon they started to fill their back because they understood I was someone 
who is trying to understand their way of life versus my way of life. And they themselves became very open to the thinking and the ideas that we shared with each other as we studied the Indian history of the great Midwest, particularly the state of Ohio. They're hungry about their history. I don't know if you realize that every year, somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 800 to 1,000 Native Americans visit this state every year because this is home to their culture. One of the casinos, and we always think about the casino, but if you go to the casino of the Eastern Shawnee in Missouri, they have this casino. Part of the winnings of this casino is put into a pot. Then they have a drawing. If your name is drawn out, you get a free bus ride to Ohio, a whole week's day paid vacation in Ohio to travel to Mound City, to travel to Newark, to travel to the Catawba Peninsula or to Putin Bay, to come back to their homeland. That's how they used some of their casino money to bring back to their heritage and their culture. So the openness is there. Well, why didn't the Indians stay in our area? Well, by the time Andrew Jackson became president, he realized that the conflict between the white man and the red man would never come to an end as long as they were alongside of each other and each other were perpetuating the idea of conflict. So he thought the best thing to do is to pick them up and move them. Well, to get them up and move them, that's gonna cost us a lot of money. But well, how are we gonna pay for it? We'll just take their land away from them, give them so much an acre and ship them out there. Well, to get them out there costs us as much as we sold the land for. So when the Indian got out there, well, then we did like all good American zoo. We sent them out a couple of grist mill operators, a blacksmith, and a failure in the ministry to spread the gospel among them. What did that do that really kind of accentuated the hostility between these two sides? Besides that, we were having them occupy land that other Indians thought was theirs to use. And now the government is dropping in the middle of Oklahoma, in the middle of Kansas, the middle of the West, foreigners to them. How would you like to have the state of Russia come over and drop about 5,000 Russians in the south end of Fremont, Ohio? This is what happened when we removed the Indians. We didn't solve the problem of conflict. We really postponed it and created another conflict which they had to learn to live with. But now they, like you and I, were all trying to search back and find our memory. Now what I got to do is I got to take a minute off, folks. I got to look at my watch because professors are notorious for talking too much too long and not saying very much in the first place. So I got to watch that, you know, I might get in trouble. And I'd not like to be on the bad side of you. He, he, he's, he's bigger than I am, so I got to be careful. Am I, am I doing all right? Okay. You let me know if I'm not doing too well because I've been known not to do too well. She reminds me constantly of how I'm not doing too well. The removal of 1840, we spent time among the Indians, and there once again we had the conflict within the people. The people were either starting to accept our civilization or willing to assimilate and the rest of them 
couldn't tolerate it any more than their ancestors could. So when removal came from the upper Sandusky Reservation, the Wyandotte Reservation, the last one that left Ohio, 1842, they moved about 640 Indians out of about 1,700 who lived there. What happened to the other 1,100? They assimilated into our culture, either here in Ohio, or they went with them as far as Indiana, which hadn't started its policy yet, stayed there, or they stopped off in Missouri. But they did remove themselves from Ohio, and we lost the ability of thriving on this integrated culture of the Native Americans which had some qualities and some components to it that would have been very good for us to retain and keep in our communities. 1842, the last of our Native Americans left this area. It was the Ottawa, and a lot of the Ottawa that occupied the peninsula that you live in went to Toledo, got on the sailboat, sailed to Cleveland, Ohio. At Cleveland, Ohio, they got on the canal, went to Portsmouth, Ohio, and there took a river boat to St. Louis, Missouri. From St. Louis, they went overland to western Missouri and eastern Oklahoma. They're still there. But stop and think about this for a minute. Many of the people that were displaced from Ohio in the 1840s were moved to Kansas. And then came the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which opened up Kansas for white settlement. And they then, what, eight years later, were asked to get up, move again, and this time, northeastern Oklahoma. And many of those tribes are still headquartered in northeastern Oklahoma, around Miami, Oklahoma, in the northeastern corner. If you know where Tulsa is, just go out of town about 30 miles northwest, Claremore in that area, that's where you'll find the major park of the reservation of the people that occupied Catawba Peninsula before your families came here to use it. They're part of our heritage. How often do you and I pay tribute to their side of our history? How often do you think about how much is the Indian taught in our schools about their way of life and what they contributed? And yet, you drive through Ohio, <laughs> And all you read many times is nothing but Indian words. Our counties, our cities, are the Portland Redskins, oh, hot doggy. Uh, you know, uh, this is what we see happening all the time. I had to get my dig in at Port Clinton. Coming from Oak Harbor, we naturally dis <laughs> It's like living in Columbus and talking to Ann Arbor, you don't do it. Uh, and yet, I've got a beautiful sister-in-law from Port Clinton, and my family is also in Port Clinton. The only difference is, between me and Defiance, I'm Buckman. You are Bookman. Same spelling, same people, same lineage. Just those damn census takers don't know how to pronounce <laughs> the thing. So anyway, folks, the rest of the evening is yours. Questions? I'll tell you, if I don't have the right answer, I'll make up a good story and tell it to you. <laughs> but otherwise, it's been a real pleasure to come back home to Ottawa County and share with you the feeble knowledge I have about a culture that occupied our world long before we showed up. Thank you.
might be one or one, two one, questions for the audience. Yes. Yeah. Have you written a book about this area? Have I written a book about this area? No. I wrote a book called The Confluence, the story of the coming together of two rivers, two cultures, but you have to move to Defiance, Ohio, to understand what <laughs> The other book that I wrote was Sorrowful Journey, which is the story of the removal of the Shawnee Seneca Indians in 1840 because of that treaty. And I wrote that book based on the diary of a wagon master who took them out. And rather than read the glorified story that comes out of the Department of Interior, he tells about the crying mother and the dying of the child and burying the child. And within 15, 20 minutes, we moved on further west. It's quite a story. It is a sorrowful journey. And a couple other little books that aren't worth reading. So, uh, I th those are... Mm. Other questions? Way in the back, John. Are there uh, burial mounds on Katana? Are there burial mounds? See, now you're getting too doggone old for me. I'm not that old. I, don't, I remember these guys in 1700. But you're back there 10,000 years ago. Are there burials in Catawba? If you want to know if there are burials in the Catawba Peninsula or on the islands, get the Archaeological Atlas of Ohio by Clyde Chatron, and he'll show you pretty much accurately where these burials are located. Now, I probably should have known this, but I'll be honest with you. It's too late at night for me to make up a story and to fool you, so I won't try. I'm sorry I don't have the right answer for you. Anything else? If not, one more. One more? Um, doctor, I've read about an area called the Glaze. Yeah. And it was a cultural center for Native Americans and the white men first arriving there found Native Americans speaking two and three and four different languages. Absolutely. The glaze takes it's place. What? It's okay. along the All Glaze okay. River. Okay. They're speaking French because of the influence of the priest and the traders. They're speaking English. They're speaking Algonquin. They're speaking Iroquois. They're speaking Spanish because of the unique situation that Spain was trying to make coming up the Ohio River to form trade with the Great Lakes area. So, yeah, they're multicultural. The Confluence is the name of my book. It's where two rivers come together. It's where two cultures come together the Native American and the white culture comes together at Defiance. Now, if you know Defiance, the two rivers come together like this. Right over here is the Glaze. Right over here is Fort Defiance, which was built by a guy by the name of Anthony Wayne. By the way, I, I, Anthony Wayne doesn't get enough. Don't get me started on Anthony. He was not mad Anthony. He was one of the smartest guys around. But let me share with you, the reason I like Wayne is he truly was the originator of the United States Army. There was no United States Army until the Wayne campaign, the Fallen Timbers. Before that, everything was state militia, volunteers, and so forth. But the first battle the United States Army ever had was Fallen Timbers. And we live in a community that has the third oldest fort Wayne ever built. My son-in-law comes from the first one, Greenville, Ohio. 
where his first fort was built. But that's, that's a whole nother story. Maybe 30 or 40 years from now, I'll come back and share it with you <laughs> when I get done doing my research. Go ahead, Paul. I've read that he wasn't called mad until he encountered the mosquitoes in the Great Black Swamp. <laughs> Anthony Wayne acquired the name Mad Anthony in Philadelphia during the American Revolution. When one of the young men that he sent out to be a spy among the British in the lo local bars came back drunk and he incarcerated him. As he thought about it more, he thought he, have, he ought to have at least 10 ten lashes. When the ten lashes were over, the guy came back and reported and said, how did he take it? He said, like a man. He says, go give him 20 more. And the guy started to call him Mad Anthony, Mad Anthony. And that caught on to all the guys in his unit that were tired of the staunchness of him and his rigid discipline. And he, the name Matt Anthony followed him ever since. So much for the mosquitoes. Now that's a story, and I don't know if it's made up by me or somebody else, <laughs> but that's a story I tell people, and yet we think there's some validity to it. Have you read any of the series by Alan Eckert? Alan? Alan's one of my favorites. He doesn't know history very much. But he sure makes you like it. And that's what's important. Alan would rather tell a good story than tell history. And yet he's been a great boon to all the rest of us historians because he lifts up to you an understanding of what was really gone in a humanistic way rather than a boring way that most historians we as a collective group are probably the greatest boredom team you've ever run in your life. But I, I, Alan Eckert brings it alive. And for that, I admire him. I've been one of his consultants for years. Great guy. One last question, William. What, what lesson should we learn from Inscription Rock about Native Americans living in this area? You're back in prehistoric times. And what is it? Inscription rock is what? They figure about 4,000, 4 to 5,000. See, that's a little before I was born. So I, I, don't, I don't know too much about that, to be honest with you. I have focused on the historic Indians north of the Ohio River, east of the Mississippi, west of the Appalachians, and south of the Great Lakes. Being a Native American historian is like being a European historian. Are you French, German, Polish, Italian, Spanish? There's just too much diversity. So if you're really going to do it, focus in on a narrow area. But thank you for the question. One more. That's it. Thank you. You mentioned an acquaintance with the Wyandotte language. Uh, did you ever get a chance to talk to Chief Bearskin, Aubrey Buser, or maybe Artie Nestle? Yes. Yes. Great Any people. Comments? Great storytellers. And really are telling it to you from their heart, which really always brings a dimension to a storyteller that is really hard to evaluate if you're a critic. And I, when I get to those people, I don't criti criticize Don Fixico or those guys who are Native American scholars because it really comes from their heart. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. I wish I'd have had you all 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs>